Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Rich Asti, the McNace Prouder by the Second Director and CEO, and I'm thrilled to welcome you back home. This is our triumphant return of the Distinguished Lecture Series, so you are making history for all of us. Welcome back, everybody. And we're thrilled that you're coming back to a Distinguished Lecture Series featuring two artists tonight, Willie Cole and Jenny Brown. And before we get to the stars of the evening, I want to give you a little history on our Distinguished Lecture Series. It actually goes back a quarter of a century. 25 years ago, we launched the series thanks to very generous support from Lewis and Francis Wagner. And among the luminaries, the thought leaders, the creatives who have graced our stage since that moment are costume designer Paul Taswell, actor Roger Reese, fashion designer Mondo Guerra, Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times art critic Holland Cotter, and the feminist artist activist, the Gorilla Girls. Since our last distinguished lecture here, which was in March of 2020, and it was given by Opera America President and CEO Mark Skorka, the McNay announced three major acquisitions of monumental outdoor sculptures. One, Tom Wesselman, uh, Standing Tulip, which you walk by as you walked up and into our lobby upstairs, and you'll see it on your way out tonight. To uh, Alejandro Martin's hashtag orange, which if you came onto our campus tonight, our newly transformed campus, newly opened campus, um, it greeted you off the North New Braunfels entrance. And the third uh, and very spectacular work is Willie Cole's The Soul Sitter, which has found a very quiet, reflective home on our grounds opposite the Patricia Ann Edwards Liberto Memorial Wall. Uh, before continuing, I just can't help but thank the funders who made the purchase of Willie Cole's Soul Sitter possible, the Russell Hill Rogers Fund for the Arts. Their support not only allowed the museum to purchase this great work, but also eight other sculptures since 1997 that have all found a very proud home on our 25-acre campus. The fund and its trustees have almost single-handedly taken the McNay's modern sculpture collection outdoors. Now, the moment we acquired Willie Cole's The Soul Sitter, our head of education, Kate Carey, and our head of curatorial affairs, Renee Barrio, envisioned the moment that you're experiencing tonight, bringing Willie Cole to the McNay in person to enlighten all of us on his process and his practice. Unfortunately, the pandemic had other plans, and we all, of course, paused. But this fall, as the public health landscape in South Texas improved, the stars aligned. Another added bonus to waiting until this very special moment is that the McNay Spotlight Program will, in 2022, feature a, a work from the collection, this time Willie Cole's The Soul Sitter, as the inspiration for the next generation of public and private K through 12 students in San Antonio in our Spotlight exhibition. So please come back in May when we open that show uh, reflected by and inspired by Willie Cole's new addition to the campus. Tonight, we're leaning into our core value of innovation at the museum, and we're trying something completely new, a conversation format rather than a traditional lecture. And we're so honored to feature San Antonio writer and professor Jenny Brown in this McNay original. Jenny, of someone who, for those of us here, needs no introduction. She is a professor at Trinity University. And in the spring of 2020, she was the Distinguished Fulbright Scholar in Creative Writing at the Seamus Heaney Center of Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Her poems and her essays have appeared in so many publications, including American Poetry Review, Oxford American, and the New York Times. Willie Cole, I wish lived in San Antonio with us, lives instead and works in New Jersey, and his art has been the subject of solo exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Miami Art Museum, and the David C. Driscoll Center at the University of Maryland. In 2021, he collaborated with the Japanese fashion designer Rei Kawakuba, Kawakubo on a collection of headpieces for the French house Comme des Garçons. I first fell, I know, I agree. I first fell under the spell of Cole's art when I experienced Household Find, one of his works from 1990 that's today at Stanford. And in that work, he repurposed an old ironing board and oriented it horizontally to simulate and simultaneously evoke an 18th century slave ship plan and also pay homage to Sarah Boone, the African-American woman who over 100 years ago patented the forerunner to the modern ironing board. That work 
has always been with me since that museum visit in California, and I'm honored and thrilled that now Willie Cole's work has found a home in San Antonio. I want to thank you all for being here tonight, for joining us in the return to the Distinguished Lecture Series and supporting the McNay always and in all ways. And I want to thank you for now joining me in welcoming Willie Cole and Jenny Brown. Hi. Hi. I think we're supposed to have a distinguished conversation. You ready? Yes. <laughs> we're keep distinguished. It, keep it keep distinguished coming. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming and and welcome and. I mean, I think we all are probably a little bit out of practice at doing these sorts of things, but but it just it feels exciting, and and I'm so happy to be here and to be here with Willie. Um, we have a plan for tonight. As as you heard, this is kind of a new format, but but my hope is really that it is going to be a conversation uh, between the two of us, uh, a little bit between our work. I have a few slides that um, I will use as a jumping off point for some questions, and I'm also uh, hoping that it can. Be a conversation with you all. There, um, you you weren't warned, but there's going to be a, a small audience participation component of our of our evening. So when I when I send the signal, I'm, I'm going to ask you to to also um, be with us in in this kind of place of active response. Um, as you heard, I'm I'm not an art critic. I'm a poet, but I think I that means that I'm someone who thinks a lot about looking and seeing. Um, Emotion and imagination, silence and patterns, and, um, and 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 really metaphor as much as as anything. And I and I that has been what's really come up for me over the past uh, couple weeks when, as I've been spending a little more time with uh, Willie's work. And one of the one of the you know sort of my go to quotes about metaphor, and it comes from Shelley's defense of poetry as if poetry needs a defense, but we've been defending it for a long time, is that metaphor marks the before unapprehended relations of things. And as I, be, as I spent more time with Willie Cole's work, this sense of it marking the before unapprehended relations of things kept coming up for me. You know? And so as a poet, when I make metaphors, I say, you know, this is that. You know, it's it's this process of um, of describing and and coming to understand something in terms of something else, and and the way that I think Willie Cole's work makes visual metaphors um, just kept blowing me away. You know, to to say that a shoe is a shoulder, or not to say it, to show it, to show that a steam iron, which we'll talk about a little bit, I hope, is a ship, or a mask, or a pedal, or a portal. I mean, I, you know, the more I looked, the more I kept being drawn into this state of understanding something in terms of something else. Um, and I think making metaphors is also an act of renaming. We say something is something else. So I thought, um, I thought we would start, and you kind of started this, Willie Cole. Um, I was going to call you an artist, but I have also, um, I have a, uh, read that you have referred to yourself by some different titles, including right. an archaeological ethnographic dataist, right. a perceptual engineer, a no-frills nature whisperer. Worshipper. <laughs> worshipper, sorry. You could be a worshipper or a worshipper. I, um, I actually tried in this, in this uh, upon reading these things, I had, a, I had a friend whose father once gave me a, a, a card that said, casual jungle fighter. So I thought I, that, <laughs> I'd like to have a card that says that. But I tried, I tried to give a few titles here after spending time with your work. Resistor of reductive definitions. Awareness activist for the Department of Energy Transference. <laughs> Magician of metaphorical manifestation. And finally, I thought this was the best one. Translator of our essential everythingness. Oh, nice. And I guess just to kind of get us going, what you know, what would you like us to call you, or and and, and you know, how might that shape how we uh, experience your work? You set me up for like so many punchlines. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm here for it. What I want you to call me? Yeah, I know. Just call me Willie. Yeah, <laughs> don't don't sweat it. You know, names are 
I mean, whatever feels good on your tongue is good for me, you know. I chose Perceptual Engineer because to me that, uh, I got that term from advertising okay. from a book called, this first book was called Subliminal Seduction, the second book was called, I forget the title, but it was about the advertising industry and how they manipulate the way that we see things. Mm -hmm. So I feel that's what I'm doing. So I like Perceptual Engineer a lot. Yeah. When I was an ethnographic dadaist, I was transitioning from being a painter. Okay. And I was finding things on the street and declaring them to be like, you know, like, like an abandoned building as an archaeological site. And I find a steam mine there. I take it apart, reassemble it as something completely different and tell you that it's something else and you believe it. Mm -hmm. The same way an archaeologist would find some bones and put them together and tell you it's a dinosaur. So that was what I was doing at that time. But now I would say perceptual engineer. Anything other than that would be more in line some of the things that you said yeah. because it's uh, you know a, ch a chaser of spirits mm -hmm. is a good one for me yeah. also God's man on earth <laughs> <laughs> is a good one for me that's okay yeah. Yeah. well I mean I did think we should let's see if I okay it's about as high tech as I can get right here um, say that again chaser of spirits chaser of spirits that's good I, I felt like uh we should, you know, talk a little bit about um, the Soul Sitter out that's out um, in the McNay on the McNay grounds. And as I told you earlier, I, I went and sat a bit with the Soul Sitter before I, I came in here. And um, you know, I I kind of had that that feeling of sort of just waiting for something to happen. You know, to sort of sit down. Um, I uh, I mentioned I'm not an art critic, but but John Berger the art critic and writer and thinker talks about the idea that, that an encounter with a work of art um, completes it in some ways for him. I and I, I don't know if you agree with that, but I think he, he talks about in some ways that encounter sort of creates a corridor from the moment in which you're standing, you know, back to the moment of creation. Mm -hmm. but, but I find, you know, in my encounter with, um, with this piece, I felt like I was waiting. I felt like the figure was waiting. I, you know, you, you, you're probably already getting the sense that when I'm looking at things, language is what I'm kind of making. And I kept thinking about the phrases that, the metaphorical kind of phrases, I, you know, to be in someone else's shoes, from where I stand, you mm -hmm. know, to be moved. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't feel like we have to understand something in a logical sense to be moved by it. Right. You know, and I guess I, I'm kind of curious about what do you hope we see um, when we stand in the corridor in front of uh, the soul. Center? Right, well, again, if it is perceptual engineering, yeah. and the work is completed once you perceive it, or at least once you look at it. Yeah. And that creates a different picture in your mind, and you've been perceptually engineered. <laughs> <laughs> so, so whatever you get from it is gonna be your individual experience, but what I enjoy is just the confounded state of you going back and forth between shoes and whatever image your, your eyes are telling you that are in front of you. Um, it's like the, when I was a kid, I was shown a TV called The Outer Limits. And they would say, do not touch your dial. <laughs> we are in control. <laughs> So I like feeling that that's what I'm doing with your brain and your eyes. Because of course, you know these are shoes, but I know you see something else. And sometimes like when my son was small, I was making out of telephones and he was probably like six years old. He started after, after seeing me make masks out of phones, he would say, dad, the phone is screaming as opposed to the phone is ringing because my masks were, and this is old phones with the dial. Just take the dial out and you got, you, know, you have that face, and that was uh, that was that experience of never seeing it the same way again. So that's what I want the viewer to experience uh, shoes differently. Uh, as I was telling Kate earlier, I think about the faculties, the higher faculties of the human mind, being perception, reason, imagination, intuition, memory, and will. So I want to be able to touch as many of those as possible with each piece that I make. So. If I'm successful with that, 
then you have that. Now you see it, now you don't experience. Because your memory is what makes you see the shoes. But if you're in the art world, your memory of Rodin sculpture makes you see the person sitting there. Uh, it's like my memory and awareness of human anatomy allowed me to see the shoes stacked up as a figure. So I'd like to have you experience that, but in your own way when you look at the work. I mean, I love that. I love that sense because I think noticing, you know, I, I, there's this quote about a writer, someone who notices what they notice. But I think, you know, a human is someone who, in some ways, in noticing what we notice, um, then we're changed in our understanding. I mean, I, it was funny when I sat there, I was, just when you said that, I was thinking, you know, you see a shoe, but you see something else at the same time. And, and, and yeah, it's like this kind of experience. I know, yeah. I mean, it was. I like that. Yeah. No, we I were hoping that he would stand up and walk towards you <laughs> when you were facing him, but I had to work on that part a bit more. I, I, I want to um, go back a little bit um, and, and, and look at a piece, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that is, is sort of um, an example of you know, some of the work that I think it's fair to say you've been, you know, you're best known for, I mean, since the late 90s, working yeah, with... Yeah, I call the, it my greatest hits. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a quote here, and it was such an interesting word, uh, and I can't remember where it was from, but that, that said, you've been preoccupied with the steam iron as a domestic, artistic, and symbolic object. And um, part of why I, I was drawn to so many of, of, of your works with the iron, but this one in particular, um, one, because it's called Domestic Shield, but two, um, a lot of what I responded to was the way that you have taken sort of what we might call Western objects mm -hmm. and, and reconstituted them or reclaimed right. them or reshaped them right. into African-inspired motifs or forms or iconography. Um, I'm not sure, is the soul sitter figure, a, not to go back to that other slide, but it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deity, an African. It's, a, it's a stack of shoes. Yeah, it's a stack of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying here. <laughs> So you've been perceptive. In I percepted it. I was. I was just holding. Well, it's not a deity, but you know what? What you just said. So yeah. I, I'm in the south of France at an art fair, exhibiting uh, my work, and I see another artist here who has a piece of what we call airport art. It's African art, but it, it has never been used in any kind of ritual or anything, and it has a wool hat on it. <laughs> Like, I guess what we call a toboggan on the East Coast. You probably don't wear those here because it's not cold enough. But when I saw that piece, that's when I got the idea that I could make uh, African things out of American objects. And that was probably like in 1983. Um, so that, that is the good yeah. awareness. That's what it's about. But the soul sitter aesthetic is from the Luba. Oh, wow. The Luba tradition. Okay, I am. Um, I spent some time in in West Africa in the in the nineties um, in Sierra Leone and had you know with the Bunda and Mende masks oh, yeah. and I didn't recognize that but I was sort of feeling it. But you know, my but what's interesting about this? I mean, there's so many things that are interesting. And that was one of my struggles and in, in kind of deciding what to ask you about is there were so many things I wanted to talk about, but you know, kind of transferring back these Western objects into sort of African. Um, figures. But when I looked at this shield, one of the things that I've been doing over the years is working with the McNe, um and with my students at Trinity on ekphrasis, which is just a fancy word for poems that are written in response to visual art. Um, and, and classically, the idea was that you described something so precisely that you recreated it. And what's interesting is sort of the iconic image of West, of the Western tradition of ekphrasis dates back to Achilles' shield in the Iliad. Mm -hmm. And there's this moment, they're in the middle of the battle, and, um, and Achilles has lost his armor. He gave it to his friend, his friend got killed, and so his mother's gone to this god of iron to forge mm -hmm. you know, this, this new shield. And so you know, the, the whole battle stops with the description of the shield, and it becomes this cinematic narrative coming to life of, um, 
and, and, and really imagining a world without war, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's really one of my favorite things in poetry, but the word ekphrasis the, simply means to speak out. You know, that's ekphrasis. And so I also read um, somewhere, uh, as I was kind of thinking about this, that, that one of the things you've said is that the materials or the, the iron, it, it talks to you or it spoke right. to you. Right. And I guess I'm just kind of curious, um, what does it say or has that changed over this uh, time? No, it hasn't changed. It, it's two, two things in your statement have triggered me. Uh, so these domestic shields and you know, I don't have a lot of preconceived notions. Everything comes from play or just from openness. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I hear the conversation with the objects. I, mm -hmm. like I, I see this, but I don't see it and say, ah, water bottle. I just check it out completely, explore it like I've never seen it in my life. So that's how the conversation begins. But these uh, domestic shields, um, I have an awareness of, of shapes and forms and things in history. So this is a Zulu shield, basically. Oh, wow. Uh, these all these I made lots of these domestic shields and I made them all as shields kind of inspired by Zulu shields but there's so many catalysts that lead to to my work and one with these pieces was a speech by Malcolm X mm -hmm. Malcolm had a speech called the house Negro and the field Negro where he says that the house Negro loved the master more than the master loves himself of course it's a longer speech but he says if if the master got sick, the house dealer would say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. So that made me think about house Negro and field Negro and what that really means. That inspired all the iron stuff oh, wow. and everything about domesticity. Mm -hmm. So in a battle, the house Negro, his shield would be his ironing board. You know, the iron... I mean, I know they didn't have electric irons, and if they did, that would have been his weapon, you know, swinging it like that. Uh, the the uh, steam holes that become evident when fabric is scorched become the tribal symbol or icon or marker or indicator of what tribe the House Negro is from. So in the 20th century, the House Negro is going to either be from Silex, Sunbeam, <laughs> Black and Decker, you know, <laughs> one of those tribes. So, so all these shields are about those kind of things. And I discovered a, a student demonstration in South Africa about maybe 10 years ago where the students were using the ironing boards as shields while the police shot were bullets at them. Yeah, yeah. That was years after I made these pieces. Yeah. So that goes back to something you said earlier where I think of collapsing time so every piece is about the past, the present, and the future. And that, the aesthetic becomes the past. And uh, the future, I guess, grows out of your imagination. The present is what's really there. But if I'm lucky, what's really there is not what you really see. You see the future and the past more than the present. So that's what I think about. Yeah. You've been listening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, collapsing time, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. there's so many people say that time is not real anyway. We're, we all is programmed to think about so many things that don't exist outside the programming. And in a way, time, time is one of them, you know, like, I, I was telling my, my daughter recently that we breathe in and we have to let it out because life is so powerful we can't hold it in very long. So we actually experience life one breath at a time or one second at a time because it is such a strong force. So um, your experience of seeing this work is a collapse of time because time is not, is not real. It's not what we think it is. But people say, oh, I ran out of time. You don't run out of time. Every moment is a gift. You run in the time when you get another moment, but you don't run out of time. But there's not enough time in the day. You know, so I go against all those things. I think things. that's kind of what I, part of what I was thinking about when I said that thing about the encounter in the corridor, because mm -hmm. it wasn't just the moment of creation, but it was the moment, you know, beyond all those moments. Or that's yeah. sort of what yeah. I felt as I've been thinking about yeah. this. You know, um, yeah. 
there were so many images, but I, and, and actually this is the part where um, I was, I, we were gonna do a, a little participatory part here um, while I'm talking about these, Not, nothing serious. But, you know, one of the things that uh, spoke to me was, uh, and this was maybe in an interview with you where, where um, someone said, you know, how do you keep um, coming back? You know, how do these materials continue to reveal themselves? And these, the five rising beauties, um, you know, one of the things that about a crassus is this sense of representation. How do you represent something? And the word itself means to to make present again, right? To represent, right? Yes. And um, I mean, I mean, I I you could do a better job than I could probably to talk about this process. But my understanding was that these were old metal ironing boards that were, mm -hmm. you know, pressed and then put through a printing press to make right, these right, prints. So right. it wasn't just, you know, you, you not only have inherited these objects, but also the process, the, the materials. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, in the art, for me, art is a business. And I'm identified with certain objects. Yeah. I didn't find these objects because I wanted to go into business, but the <laughs> objects found me, and they still talk to me, so I still work with them. Um, the ironing board is loaded. Yeah. I mean, you, <laughs> the iron is loaded, you know. These are, there are a lot of objects that are really loaded, but the iron, the ironing board are extremely loaded. They have a lot of contact with human beings, so they, for me, they have a lot of spirit as a result of that. They have a lot of history. And in my family, there are women who worked as domestics. Mm -hmm. My great grandmother was a domestic. I'm sure her mother was too, because that was antebellum time. So these ironing boards, without me knowing at the time, they became uh, almost reliquaries or symbols to represent all these women in, in our culture, our society, who have worked as domestics. And in, they're all named after women in my family. Okay. For that reason, but yes, so some they weren't all old, <laughs> but we made them old. Made them look old. Again, you know, time is a construct. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we surf down the hill, get them all scratched up. We ran over them with the truck. We hammered them, and we got them so thin that they were like paper. You could do that, and they would just, you know, they would just do that. So. I'm a teacher at heart, and when Kate and I were discussing how this might go, I said, well, what if we just had people also participate in the response? And one of the things that I read was that you make word lists, you know, just as a way of kind of creating this associative subconscious kind of logic that we're talking about. And I felt myself looking at these, you know, they both appear devastated and majestic. <laughs> I mean, they look like ghosts and they look like saints. They look like graves and they look mm -hmm. like portraits. I mean, I kept returning to them. And I guess, you know, one of the things that um, is interesting for me as someone who, who doesn't necessarily, I mean, I don't teach art history, but I try to talk with students about having, um, having an encounter, and one of the things I asked them to do is make word lists. So I thought I would just um, offer up this opportunity that one of the things that helps me kind of respond or think or be with a work of art is just making a list of five words that sort of come to me or to you when you look at these. Or another assignment that I often give is thinking about, yeah, you better get with this. <laughs> you know, just. You know, what are five words that, um, like, what do these say to you? Or another Yeah, well, they, they probably say more in real life than they do in a projected image. Yeah. So I'd be curious as to what words people describe to them. But they say, clearly they say to me the names underneath them. The, the women. Uh, Again, the naming. You know, you know, I, I have the awareness of domestic violence in my family. I have the awareness of extreme servitude in my family, poverty in my family, metal workers in my family. There's so many, so many things. That, well, and that's kind of to my point, tr trusting what you see. You know, I think that's often when I bring students to the McNay, it's it's they're like, well, I don't I don't know what it's about. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. what it's about is often the associations that right. you bring and this to was it. not it wasn't my intention to make this piece 
Uh, actually, I called it Five Beauties Rising, but it wasn't my intention to make this piece at all. Uh, it's funny because uh, from 1988 to maybe 1999, I had a show at Museum of Modern Art in 99. And in 99, I said, okay, I guess all my iron time is over because now I got this show at MoMA, I'm gonna start doing something different. And one of my collectors said, no, this is the time to really focus on it and get more out into the world. But I didn't have an intention to make this, but mm -hmm. what happened, because I, talking about names, so another name. <laughs> when it comes to irons, I'm Wooly the Scorch. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> If I was on the Sopranos, I would have been called Willie the Scorch. Willie the Scorch. <laughs> Probably because it's Scorch and Deep Scorch gets brown or black. And, I, and I'd be a hitman, Willie the Scorch. So because I am Willie the Scorch, when I showed up at this studio, they already had irons and iron boards all around the studio, expecting me to do that because that's what people that's think right. I want to do all the time. You know? <laughs> so, but I accepted it because I also believe in the flow. Um, sometimes saying no is not the way to go. And I don't mean to rhyme, I know you're a poet. <laughs> <laughs> Poems don't have to rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right. So, so I went with that flow, and this is what came up. But yeah. I actually thought that I was making a port. This is another challenge for artists, at least for me, is that an idea limits the possibility of growth. It's better just to go with the flow. So my first impulse was to make a port and have a bunch of ships, you know, all like docked there. And the iron board would become the ships because mm -hmm. I had made slave yeah, ships slave previously. Ship yeah. So I started uh, working on that concept. Um, but by the time I got to the point of printing the iron to see what each one looked like, I knew that it was beyond my preconceived notion yeah. and I yeah. should just really go with that flow. And that's sort of it, following, I mean, <laughs> I mean, whether that rhymes or not. Um, right. <laughs> um, we're going to return to these words in a second, and, and, and there will be some time for questions and answers, and if anyone wants to share those, there'll be a mm -hmm. chance to do that. But I, um, let's keep going to one more. I just want to say, so this piece, this, there are like 20, I think 23 of these iron boards in this whole series. And they're currently being shown at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Okay. And one room, like the whole room is wrapped around with these prints. And it's a good feeling. Actually, I'm headed there at the end of, uh, I have two stops before I get there, but the 17th of November, I'll be doing a talk there about these pieces. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, one of the things that I think I always often tell my students is, you know, just, Pay attention to what sort of strikes you speechless. And I will say that um, this work in particular, I, I would really love to see it in person, you know, because yeah, I kind of yeah. stood before it. And, um, you know, because yeah. it both is what it says, you know, and, and, yeah. and form and function. And, and it says so much. Yeah. It's yeah. been called uh, my Rothko Chapel. Yeah. So I hope one day it gets a building of its own. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wanted to, uh, you know, just kind of to, there you are. Um, I wanted to actually just, and not to make a bad pun, but, you know, I That's think okay. one of I the... I love bad puns. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> well, as, you know, as uh, uh, during my time as Poet Laureate of Texas and, you know, and kind of working in the civic sphere, I mean, I was often asked, you know, so how does my, you know, work sort of address the pressing issues, that was my pun, you know, the pressing issues of the time. Um, you know, what does poetry do? And I, and I get a little high and mighty about like, why is poetry asked to do things? You know, sure. it's, it's a poem, but I, but I do, I do, I am curious about um, what seems to be some of the ways your work is moving in the direction of, um, of using reclaimed materials like plastic water bottles, um, mm -hmm. and, and even more just about repetition, you know, not, back to the word thing. I mean, one of the things that, um, another assignment I often give students is just to, together, to pick a word and just repeat it for five minutes straight. We just repeat the same word over mm -hmm. and over and over until the word almost becomes meaningless, but at the same time, it becomes a part of us. You know, it just mm -hmm. becomes this sonic kind of vibration. Mm -hmm. And I guess when I was looking at this, I was thinking about, you work a lot with repetition, 
-hmm. Repetition, I think, has magical incantatory qualities. I agree. I, I, agree. I so I'm, I mean, I'm kind of interested in sort of your take on art being asked to do more than be art, but also just kind of these these questions of awareness and action. Um, may I might have read that this piece came to you in a dream, mm -hmm. or that the it you did, know so did. sort of dreams and repetition. Um, right. Just kind of curious about, there was this little bit of a poem, I actually wrote this down, by George Oppen that came to me when I was looking at this. It's real short. Obsessed, bewildered by the shipwreck of the singular, we have chosen the meaning of being numerous. And there was something about hmm. that sense of just... I like a copy of that. Yeah, I'll give it to you. But um, that isn't even really a question, but you want to talk a little bit about right. it? Well, <laughs> you know... It's challenging to start on these topics, so I'm jumping in maybe from the middle. But I think about how, and I've said this before, and I am like totally, what's the word, blown out, overexposed, or on the internet. So anything I say, you can probably find me saying it again in a video somewhere on the internet. <laughs> but I think about how we are all made out of one thing. You know, we are all in everything, not just the people at the chairs, everything in here broken down to its most minute particle is the same thing. So that's why I do that. I tell people I, I create art the same way nature does mm -hmm. from a single molecule. <laughs> so now in this case with the water bottles, I assign the bottle as my molecule. Mm -hmm. So I just make something out of that. It's, it's a greater creator challenge than making an object out of several things. So in my studio, everything is separate. I got a space just for water bottles, a space just for shoes, a space just for bicycles, a space just for guitars, whatever I'm working on. So I don't get tempted to like, oh, I'll take that basketball and make it an eyeball <laughs> in this water bottle piece. You know? I don't want to do that. I, I want the challenge of it. Uh, it it comes also from just the force of repetition in sound, you know, um, just that every, everything is one thing. That's, that's probably the most simple answer. Everything is one thing. But I recognize the power of repetition. You know, I used to practice Buddhism and spend hours chanting, you know, nam yo renge yo nam yo renge yo nam yo renge for like, you know, half hour, an hour, saying this thing over and over again. And even today, as a no frills nature worshiper, mm -hmm. I still have things that I <laughs> chant to myself every day. You know, uh, I went through a period of life where I would chant a psalm from the Bible every day. So I've always been very interested in the power of repetition and the power of rhythm. I'm very into rhythm and music. So, and transforming objects becomes more magical if it's one object repeated. It had a cellular feel to me, or molecular feel, and, and mm -hmm. I think, and, I, and even the title to me, From Water to Light, I mean, yeah. this which is could a, describe our bodies. Um. <laughs> this is a fire station, and I forget the exact dimensions, but it's, I basically turned it into two rooms that are 15 by 15. See the curtains in the background on the sides uh, hide the firehouse part of it, so you just see the walls I made out of bottles. And in each room, there's a chandelier. You can see the second chandelier in the back in the opening there. And it was a total transformation of the space. Uh, people started calling it the Plastic Chapel and all kinds of things like that. We, we did a music performance in there the last day of the show, and it was pretty amazing. Uh, water to Light, the title has to do with, of course, there was water in the bottle, and now there's light in the bottle. <laughs> but it also, in my mind, when you turn up the bottle of water, I guess I could use a real one, turn up a bottle of water, you're putting your air in the bottle, so now your spirit's in the bottle, and the water's in you. So I thought of it that way as well. That's why it's the spirit chaser. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or the energy transfer. I can't remember the yeah. other names I gave. Yeah, you. so. So um, we got about you know, 15, 20 minutes left. We, let's talk about America. Just a yeah. small topic. <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, I, I actually, um, this is actually a piece that is in the collection of SAMA and is a part of a series of, um, of textual pieces that, um, you call them 
back well, back acronyms like acronyms but backronyms yeah. <laughs> and so um, I mean it's I think pretty self-explanatory in that it's sort of an associative list of mm -hmm. words and um, and things and ideas that sort of you know to me it almost feels like you took you know it's sort of what would happen if you opened the attic door and all these things sort of fell out? I love the physicality of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess what I wanted to say is that I find, you know, making lists or, or associating from letters and words, you know, yes, it's chance, but it also is a way to kind of open up, um, open up words. And so one of the things with the word list you made, if there's a word that you want to kind of kind of build on, or you were saying earlier, actually making a sentence, you know, authorized yeah, mood, yeah, enhancing I, remedy, I improves like cognitive sentences. ability. Yeah, yes. So in the 80s, I was every kind of artist you could imagine. I was in a band, I was in a theater company, I was writing plays, I was doing poetry readings, just everything, but then, in 1989, in 1990, I was, quote unquote, discovered by the New York art world with the Scorches. So now suddenly I was Willie the Scorch. Everybody wanted me to make stuff out of irons. I didn't have time to write anymore. So I decided to make these pieces so I could still write. So you could still write. And that's how I started doing them. The first one I did was Columbus. Oh, yeah. and I don't remember any of those sentences. <laughs> but I did Columbus, and it just kind of just started going from there with notebooks. Because once you get started, it's hard to stop. Yeah. For me, anyway. I mean, I've, I've been called obsessive with a lot of things. But it's hard, it's hard to stop. Like, now I'm writing a children's story called Shoe Fly. Because I made a sculpture out of shoes that looked like it wanted to fly. <laughs> so I decided to turn it into a character for children's books. And it's all in rhyme. It's all pretty much based on uh, the rhythm of ham bone, ham bone, where you've been around the world, I'm going again. But it's not that. It's like a fly flew in my window the day that I wore my mom's shoes for play. <laughs> so it goes on, but that's the rhythm of it all. And I find that, like if I had been writing today, I'd be speaking in rhyme to you all now. <laughs> <laughs> so with these Americas, I just started hearing them everywhere. Yeah. Like I would sit down and watch the news and write the words in this story that begin with one of the letters A, M, E, R, I, C, or A, and, and then go back and turn it into a sentence. And that's, that's how they came about. But I really enjoy doing these. I've done the word art, the word America, the word Columbus, the word virus I did recently during the pandemic. So many other words. Eventually I'll have a book of them, but it was a lot of fun to do. A lot of fun to do. You know, and I think, I think often people think you, to, to start a poem, you have to have this big idea, but poems are made of words, you yeah, know? And yeah. I think words lead you to new words. Um, I'm going to read uh, maybe one or two poems, because in, in looking at this, I too, um, especially in the past, about 2016, started on a new body of work that, um, that was kind of trying to untangle my own associations with mm -hmm. America, what it meant to be American, how, how I felt about that. Um, and so I'm going to read just uh, two. They're short. Um, but kind of taking ideas about America or phrases and sort of seeing where they led me. So this is a short one. And, and kind of America becoming this shape shifter. So this whole sequence of uh, uh, this new book is called um, This Part of the Country. Um, so I'll, I'll, read, I'll read these and then maybe we can finish and maybe hear some words from the audience, um, if you're willing. America's Got Talent, a one-night stand in Jackson, Mississippi, the soft opening outside Cheyenne, there's a laughing gull on Miami Beach, and the ampersand tattoo you didn't regret getting in Portland, although you kept forgetting which part of your body you were supposed to use for lifting whole seasons of unpredictable rage and flowering. You've practiced steering into the skid. You're only nine miles from Comfort, Texas, but you did not come here by machine. You did not come to carry that gun 
wet trees and idling trucks, a whole shelf of expired pain relief back in the back, and behind that, the game where you keep paying a hook to drop, grasping for the hind of some bright half-buried animal. We keep saying now more than ever, but I've never seen anyone leave this part of the country with anything but stone fruit or ash on their hands. Obviously, this is perhaps a darker version of America's talent. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to that slide. Yeah. yeah I haven't read. seen this in a long time. Yeah, read something. I have one. The one I had memorized was my favorite one. That Adam makes Eve regret ingesting contaminated apples. <laughs> <laughs> but I see some pretty good ones in here. Able tonight. men everywhere rate it choice A. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. African mothers' embryos remain in custody afterwards. But just try to make, you know, it's like, I studied screenwriting, and I was told that you, if you can't tell your story in one sentence, you don't know your story. So in this case, I try to make every sentence be like a very visual story. I guess not quite a haiku, not quite a poem, but a backronym. A ba I, I'm, I'm going with backronym. <laughs> I feel like um, I should end with a San Antonio poem since we're here, and okay. then and then we'll and it's a bit more hopeful. Um, and both of these felt very much in conversation with your work. I guess is why I chose them when they asked if I would read something too. It should say America. That's okay though. When America cuts my daughter's hair, every chair in the strip mall salon where she rents a little space of her own reflects a face waiting to make a change. Another mother next to me rips an ad for the full Hollywood wax and here the best graffiti, don't do drugs, be sad. They'll grow back, my own mom on the bangs I butchered more than once. Do you think America is pretty? This skinny blonde kid who never really has to ask if she is asks me as we walk more hot city blocks because by now we've chopped the pecans to protect the power lines. I think America is pretty. Appears to Kana with one side of her own dew done in deep brown waves, the other buzzed tight and dyed a bright chemical green. America fits the description. And when she's done, holds up her small mirror in the big one, turning my girl around so she can see herself. You can call me Erica, she says, if you like, but we like America better here. I think, uh, Obviously, yeah, it's more, more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I hope it ends on this note about what do we look at that helps us see ourselves differently? And that has really been um, the most powerful thing that I've taken away from spending time with your work these past few mm -hmm. weeks is how can we put ourselves in a position um, to, 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 to notice what we see and allow it to change us? And I think that final end. Yeah, well, I just want to say that. Uh, you got to go beyond your education for sure. Yeah. Because in some ways, knowing is not knowing. You know, I mean, like, like I said, once, once I say, yeah, it's a water bottle, I'll never see there's anything else again. Because it's not really a water bottle. Even if I just stayed on the surface, this is, uh, what's it called? Uh, PET. You know, sh shaped like a bottle. <laughs> you know. So just be open to go beyond the obvious in everything you do. Even when you ad address other people, you know, so yeah, he's a 70 year old uh, white man from Minnesota, but he's much more than that. You know? I mean, the stereotyping is what creates so many problems. Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a poor black man from the projects in Newark, New Jersey, but I'm much more than that. <laughs> You know, that's 
why I'm God's man on earth. This was the sort of the last slide that I had pulled up, and I think in response to what you just said, what moved me about it was this enacting of, I mean, what Whitman might say, we, you know, we contain multitudes, but also our multitudes are, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a face that has, you know, almost like the, the stencil of the right, past the on it. Scarification. <laughs> well, the scars. <laughs> of the Silex tribe. Yes. <laughs> you know, the spirit, which literally, and then, you know, here we are coming out of this time where we've all worn masks. Right. You know, right. and I had this odd, of course, relationship now that reminded me of Zoom boxes, not really, but you know, this notion of, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I guess, and then we can maybe open it up to questions, but um, looking forward, has this time changed your work? This is an older print, but I, right. I you know, when you, well, when the, you look at yourself or where you're going, has the I mean, time <laughs> changed my work. I like to think that I'm changing every day. Right. Pandemic or no pandemic. You know, a lot of artists do the same thing forever. But I I like to change. I'm always open for something new. Uh, because of marketing I get pigeonholed into things for a while and then I make a change and they have to catch up with me. <laughs> it's like I remember the first shoe piece that I made. I put it in a box, take it to the gallery in New York City, uh, leave it there, go back to my studio. And I get a call, they don't know what it is. You know, uh, they don't know. To me, it was a couple hugging. It was a man and a woman like this, men of the shoes. But nobody saw that except me. You know? hmm. And it took them probably like, I can't say in days or months, but probably took them about four pieces of art beyond that to be able to see what I was after. And it had probably to do with me getting better at it. But it was so funny to me that they that nobody could see it. So I decided to make work using less shoes so they could see it better. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this piece, Man, Spirit, Mask, uh, that iron in the middle is a spirit because the evidence of the spiritual power in the, scorch, in the steam iron is the scorch. Uh, that power is concealed by the body of the iron, which is the mask. Uh, the mask is on my face in that panel on the right, but it's my face is upside down for aesthetic reasons. I like that glow behind the ears. <laughs> down, yeah. But change is what it's about for me. Change is uh, representative of growth, and growth is not just a human condition, but the life condition. Nothing should be stagnant. You know, the universe is in motion, so why shouldn't we be in motion? The future. The future. <laughs> the future. I love this. I don't have a question about uh, it. <laughs> well, this is funny. Now, I mentioned my children's story. So I did in the 70s. Let's go back in time. When you get a certain age, you're always going backwards. <laughs> I thought time so didn't in the, exist. In the, in the 70s, I worked as an illustrator. And I, I published a couple of children's stories in the 70s for magazines. And I did them in watercolors. So my new story that I'm working on now, I want to do watercolors. But I hadn't done watercolors since the 70s. But because of the pandemic, I was in and out of different slumps of doing nothing. Maybe getting locked into Tiger King and you know, <laughs> doing stuff on TV or feeling sorry for the world, that kind of thing. So I would assign myself one day projects. Yeah. So during this period, I forget what month this was, but my goal was to do one watercolor a day. Yeah. And because of my commission with Coma de Garçon, I had to photograph each piece I made, because they were in Tokyo. So I made these things out of shoes and put them on my head. I took pictures of myself. So I had all these photos of myself wearing these different head pieces made from shoes. So I said, OK, so I'll paint one of these a day. So this is from that time. So each one was, was a one day, one day piece. I'm also a fan of just those small assignments, you know, yeah, kind of yeah. the thing that, uh, again, repetition. Yeah. But also, but also just. Um, yeah, and see the background, those blue yeah. lines, that yeah. is my earliest repetition oh, wow. from being a big fan of Seurat and pointillism and even Impressionism, was to break the world down into small hash marks and only use primary colors. So um, 
that was my painting style before I was doing sculpture. I always like limited palettes or limited objects because it forces creativity. So red, yellow, and blue primary colors. You know, I was a big fan of the illustrator Maxfield Parrish, and he only used red, yellow, and blue. But you look at his paintings; he's got a full spectrum there. So. I decided I would just use those colors in painting. And even this painting, even though it looks like it's a painting in color, it's still just those three colors, red, yellow, and blue. We have just a minute or two, but uh, if anyone has a question or you've made something here, just wants to offer up a tiny little wordless poem or a sentence, or just um, before, we, before we call it a night. It's... I thought I was going to say something too about soul researchers. Uh -huh. Well, that's, that's, again, that's, that's, you've been perceptually engineered. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, 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 designed, it's designed to trigger elements that are in your own memory. I mean, I, there's so many things that I read wrong because I think I'm, you know, associating and I'm just seeing the first couple letters and moving on like almost like the Evelyn Wood speed reading course. <laughs> just zoom right past it. You know? So Soul Sister is fine. I chose Soul because of Soul, S-O-U-L. You know? I chose Sitter because of uh, Rodin. There's a question over here. I have a question that's probably pedestrian since I'm not a lover or collector of art. What happens, <laughs> what happens after the exhibit? And I'm particularly curious about the chandelier. I thought that was fabulous. And I'm thinking, prom's coming up. That would be great, right, for the kids. <laughs> but what, that's a lot of work. And I'm assuming construction and lots of people putting that up. Right. Then what happens to it at the end of March? Right. Well, see, I make my living this way. So everything I make is for sale. <laughs> so hopefully after the exhibit, everything is sold. And was it? Because we'll take it. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> But sometimes it takes more than like 30 days to make the sale. So the gallery, at least the gallery in New York, they will store until stuff is sold. The chandeliers are not part of my regular art, uh, commercial art life. Like my gallery doesn't show a lot of water bottle pieces. But I get a lot of commissions for water bottle pieces. So they're in people's homes. Uh, they're in movie theaters. Do you do prompts? Like that. <laughs> you know, I tried to get, I actually had a, a prompt on my website to solicit people to commission me to do weddings and things. Yeah. Because I personalize a chandelier by putting photographs in it. Oh. Like if I did a chandelier about this event, each of your faces would be in one face per bottle. You know. so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So you said, you like art because you wouldn't be here. So that was, uh, you misspoke when you said you're not a lover of art. You meant to say you're not a collector of art, right? I would like to be a collector of art. Yeah. I have my, my mother bought my first piece mm -hmm. uh, for me for Christmas. I probably don't appreciate it to the level that the clothing came here. Mm -hmm. It came because my friend said, <laughs> Welcome to our world. <laughs> okay, back there. Yeah. I've always had problems with Scaparelli's shoe hat, but I'm sure you know mm -hmm. it's never worked for me. It <laughs> always just looks like she's got this stupid shoe on top of her head. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow your shoes just absolutely work as hats <laughs> or shoulders or whatever they are. Right, right. And now I'm going to go back and look at Scaparelli's again and see if it can, yeah. I can make it work well, now because you see, of you. You see, mine is working because of what you saw with the Scaparelli, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but way back up there. Um, You're pretty loud. You're good. Yeah. Um, I teach younger elementary school art, and we're using you as our inspiration. And right now, they're like with COVID, they're just not inspired. Mm. 
but we're finding like normal things, yeah. like a water bottle. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> and they're creating artwork, and it's so cool. To see. It's like what they connect with, and I just think it's really cool what you're doing, and well, you've you. helped us. You know, after COVID and everything, they don't want to do anything. Right. And they're, I don't, I get it. And they're just, they're doing really cool stuff. But it's about what you were saying about the repetition, using one thing over and over again. Yeah, yeah. And they get that. They need, if I give them a bag of stuff, they'll be like, I don't know what to do with it. But yeah. mm -hmm. pick one thing and yeah. go with it. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, you know, I, I started out this whole, after being a painter for so many years, started out with a single object dismantled and reassembled to be one thing, archaeological graphic dadaist, period. <laughs> you know, but somehow that evolved into multiplying a single object. Uh, I've done residencies at museums where I did a, a workshop or a class, and I would have the students or participants take an object apart and reassemble it to look like something else, which was always uh, fun and challenging at the same time. I was a fellow at the University of Georgia in 2005, and my favorite project was uh, making puzzles. So I would buy a puzzle. Students would never see the picture on the box. We'd lay out the piece on the table, and uh, two or three teams, and just work on the puzzle because my work today is pretty much based on my experience as a kid doing puzzles. You know, it's like a pile of shoes is like a puzzle without a box. I notice something there. I don't know what it is, but if I keep putting the piece together, it will emerge. And uh, it's what my sister calls a let go and let God moment. <laughs> when you give up the knowing and are just happy with the being and have faith that your being will turn into something. So that's my approach. I don't know if that helps the kids or not, but <laughs> that helped me a lot. Oh, do we have time for one more? Are we, we're, one more. Okay. This is, okay. Oh, that's, I like that way you phrase what type of musician am I? <laughs> I'm the kind of musician that uh, <laughs> that wished he was a better musician. <laughs> well, I, I studied the, f I went to high school for art and music. This is a long story, but I have to keep it short. I like giving the details. So my school, you had to be an art major, a music major, and I begged them to let me do both. Um, so by my sophomore year, they had allowed me to replace my lunch period with music theory classes. Because I really wanted to do the music. And I've been playing music since I was a little kid, but not really with knowing what I was doing. I had an organ, a harmonica, and a guitar since the age of, uh, well, I had the harmonica since I was three. But I got the organ and the guitar when I was eight. When the Beatles came to the U.S., I begged my dad for a guitar. And he went to pawn shop and got me one. Um, so I love every instrument, but I studied the flute in the 70s to play jazz. Uh, when I was a fellow at University of Delaware, I took a piano course. I didn't know how to play the piano, but I sat for every class with my headphones on and listened to Bella Bartok. I never learned to play anything. When I was at Boston U, my best friend was a piano major. And he would sit down after day every, every day and play the hits from the 70s. And everybody would cheer and be happy. And then he would turn to me and say, okay, Willie, now you play. And I would go, bling, blong, blong, bling, blong, blong. And everybody would laugh. So that made me determine to play the piano. And I'm trying to keep it short, but these details are cool for me. <laughs> so then I read that Melvin Van Peebles, the, the father of independent filmmaking, taught himself to play the piano by writing numbers on each key. So I did that in the 70s. And I learned to play my favorite songs on the piano anyway. You know, I, I still couldn't play Chopin or Brahms. But there were jazz songs I learned to play from just doing the numbers. Uh, but I always had a guitar. So uh, some years later, when I didn't have a piano, I transposed all my piano songs to the guitar. And I started taking classical guitar lessons. So nowadays, I'm primarily a guitar player, acoustic guitar player. And I play bluegrass. 
I play uh, I play a lot of uh, jazz, and I'm currently learning uh, Spanish Romance and Nocturne uh, 20 by Chopin. So that's the kind of musician I am. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in thanking Willie Cole and Jenny Brown. <laughs>